And the truth of the matter is, if we, if Abraham had done what God told him to do, <laughs> right. he would have killed Isaac. Yeah. <laughs> but he had to have an open ear. And I believe that once we pray and we fast, the next best thing for any ministry could do that we could do is get time and do some strategic planning. Um, it takes more than prayer. It takes prayer plus a plan. Then you can move forward. And I just found out again in the church marketplace, we are just praying. But it's not about transformation. It's about transform action. And I believe that that's what has to happen over the next day. Absolutely. Authentic mm -hmm. faith requires action. Right. Oh, if, there, yeah. if there's no action connected to it, it's really not faith at all. No. It's just, a, you know, it's just something you're doing. That's right. That's Absolutely. Right. And I see that. I, th I think the fasting and the prayer gives us clarity. Yes. But, you know, and gives us the vision. But we still have to act on it. And that's, that's, you're so right there. It's that next stage of action and that, that really is key. strategic planning allows you to write that vision down right. so others can be a part of it. Right, and if you write it down, you can hold people accountable for that. Mm -hmm. You know, because everyone's bought in, they can see it on a daily basis. It's why we write, we learn to read and write so we can follow. That's what the Bible's all about. <laughs> well, doesn't the Bible command us to do exactly. that, right? Exactly. Yeah. Write the vision. Absolutely. And you have to Make do that. Plain. And it goes with, um, Bishop, what, what we were saying earlier about learning how to operate in a business model. There's it's success in that. What is your revenue generating plan other than tithes and offerings? What is your growth strategy? <laughs> not for this year, not for five years. What's your 100 year plan? It's but then the environment is the important because if a church has not been in that environment, then that's why you have to get in another environment. And when you get out again, as I travel, and you're in an environment and everybody thinks the same, you're not going to make any changes. So you're going to have to leave where you are and go somewhere and invest in a conference. Let your people know, because if your people don't understand where you are, you've got to put them in another atmosphere that's going to help foster what you're talking about. And a lot of times pastors try to communicate to a congregation that's stuck in an antiquated kind of model and um, all the preaching and teaching that they'll do. You got to take some people with you to a conference. You got to take some of your key leaders who can help go back and help transform the minds of the persons in your church. You alone, they expect you to be all over the place. Carry a couple of key people with you. They, there you go. Absolutely. Then they can help get the message to, because, because they're influential as well. And complementing that now with virtual technology, the virtual conferences. So, Abs yeah. I mean, I've seen some technology that's just, well, I mean, it's literally over the last 90 days where you can take um, an entire conference, like your annual convocation, and you can put it all virtual, even the exhibit hall, where companies are in this virtual exhibit hall. And it's like, Wow, the, the, the innovation is changing, and you're right. We cannot innovate on antiquated foundations, or we won't have a 100-year plan. We'll be reactively looking at what somebody else is doing. Chasing our tails. Chasing our, yeah. chasing our tails. Let me, let me get to some critical, some critical questions. Um, to Sita, I'm a strong proponent of investing, and I also believe that our communities um, particularly underserved communities. We've got to be open to pooling our resources, pooling our monies, but we also have to do it in proving best practices and vetted opportunities. Uh, we talk about alternative revenue streams. What can churches legally do to protect themselves in this regard when it, in terms of, we, we don't want to cut investment opportunities out of the church because it's a part of the kingdom experience, but it has to be done with balance and integrity um, and just, you know, good business sense. Right. I, I believe, I, I completely agree with you. I, I think the church should be the most savvy institution in the world. It should diversify. It should look at other things. I mean, we're about, the church is about not only salvation, not only uh, impacting your congregants, but going out into the community and impacting your community. What better way to do that than to generate jobs? What better way to do that? I mean, what, what type of outreach or what better outreach is to, is to help an, an unemployed person become employed, to provide services, to, to have investment initiatives, to have community redevelopment? But here's the key. You have to know what you're doing. And you have to make sure that you have the right professionals around you. We cannot have gentlemen's agreements, even in the church, 
as much as I love to shake your hand and believe that you're going to do what we're saying you're going to do, it doesn't happen like that all the time. Make sure you're negotiating your deals, even with your congregants. Make sure that the deals are in writing, that they're signed by both parties. Make sure that you have a lawyer overlooking that deal to, to just advise you of, of the do's and don'ts. So there are quite a number of things um, that you can do to protect yourselves while still impacting the community and executing the charge that the church has. That's powerful. We're going to come back in the future and do a, a program specific to investing and really deal with that. You know, I call it a, a spirit of greed. You know, everybody's greedy. You know, this is the season for conservatism. You know, you know, if it's a good deal, it's going to be a great deal in the future. You don't have to jump today, do your due diligence, have your lawyers look at it, and be conservative. Nobody should put all of their eggs in, in, in one hand. So we're going to come back and, and, and deal with that. Now, speaking of criminal lawyers, I'm going to jump to something else real quick um, that we have to deal with. I mean, when you look at what's happening at uh, Penn State, I'm a Penn State alum, by the way, you look at Syracuse, and you look at some of the other you know, institutions, and even in Memphis the AAU, other day, the yeah, AAU. AAU. I mean, wow. people with trust, it's, it's in the higher institutions, um, and not even as it happened at the, the profile level, it's also happening in our families, you know, in the workplace. One in six boys are sexual abused. One in, I have four boys, I'm like, what? I, what? <laughs> One in four girls are sexually abused. Not my princess, not yours, you know? 40% um, of victims are under the age of 18. 80% are under the age of 30. Every two minutes, someone in the U.S. is sexually assaulted. And now it's coming into the kingdom. Reality of it, it's been there all the time and we haven't addressed it. But now because it's coming into the media with the proliferation of social media, people are gaining their voice, and I commend everybody who legitimately, legitimately has an issue, reclaim your voice. But now let's talk about real quickly, and this is showing to itself as well, all these are spinoffs, but let's, let's talk about sure. how, uh, Greta, from an HR perspective, to mitigate some of these things in the church culture. It's, it's extremely important to educate and advocate. Okay, the education has to be with the participants. If you have a school or a community, they have to know what their rights are. They also have to know how to use their voice. Okay, if they do have a question or concern, creating a concern hotline that is overseen by an outside third party where they feel comfortable calling and, you know, airing their concerns is extremely important. On the other hand, the institutions themselves have to be educated. If someone brings forth a concern, how do I address that? What are my legal responsibilities to address these things? If I know something and I just say, well, I'll take care of it, did I get back with that person and let them know how I handled that? So it has to be an education. Policies need to be in place. People need to be educated. People need to understand their roles and their responsibilities on all sides. And oftentimes what happens is people are afraid to speak because many times the people that they would share information with are someone in a powerful and authoritative position. So having that outside objective third party that manages that concern hotline for them allows them an opportunity to give their concerns to someone who is not going to be judgmental, who's not going to come back and retaliate against them. So it's really important to have many, many factors in place, you know, that are involve all of those elements. So we're running out of time. We've actually run <laughs> out of time, but Bishop, real quickly, speak to it. I think she addressed it all. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, I can start it. We sure will. We'll be here forever. That's a good thing. Okay. Good. I'll jump good in deal. for a second good if deal. you don't mind. No, go ahead. I think, you know, today it's, it's just all about values. You know, when things like that went off, ding, 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 the alarm should have gone off. Yeah. Something should have happened. A call to action should have been taken care of. And that's, that's, that's the only thing I see is you got, we got to bring back that passion. We got to bring back, you know, right and wrong and be very clear what is right and wrong. Wow, what a powerful and engaging conversation. I want to thank each of these experts for investing their time and intellectual currency in this conversation. I also want to thank you for listening and participating in this engaging and interactive conversation on best practices and vetted solutions for repositioning 
the church and your life to manifest its divine purpose throughout all culture and all issues. It's our mandate. Let's occupy the church. Let's occupy communities. Let's occupy our hearts and our lives together. What must we do to navigate the prophetic and challenging journey that is before us? In order to manifest the definitive purpose that God has created for each and every one of us to experience in the earth, we must embrace and do these five things. Number one, adapt the mindset of God. Number two, we must follow Christ. Number three, embrace our manifest destiny. Number four, learn and implement trusted and proven systems in every area of our lives. Number five, embrace and implement a collective and collaborative roadmap for the church and our communities. To this end, I want to invest into your life. I want to sow a seed of knowledge, understanding, and direction into your mind. For the next 24 hours, I'm giving complimentary, that's free, digital copies of my best-selling book, Your Manifest Destiny, Seven and a Half Words to Transform Your Future. Work the system by my friend and colleague, Sam Carpenter, and a secret chapter from my upcoming release, Occupy the Church, a prophetic roadmap for the global church. In addition, you can connect directly with the experts that have invested their time with us on today. You have three ways to get these best-selling books today. Number one, go to www.OurEconomicDignity.com or scan the QR code that's on the screen or follow us on Twitter at SolutionsTV. V. That's at Solutions TV, and we'll reciprocate with a link for you to get the resources. I also encourage you to advise everyone in your immediate network to do the same. For where you are going, it's critical that people around you have access to the same information and knowledge, particularly if they're going to remain in your inner circle. Take action now. Go to www.OurEconomicDignity.com or scan the QR code that's on the screen or follow us on Twitter at Solutions TV. Again, thank you for investing your time in viewing this interactive conversation on best practices and solutions for repositioning ourselves to manifest our definitive purpose in the earth and beyond. It's our collective mandate. Until next week, remember, a mind without barriers creates ideas without limitations. What barriers are you allowing to limit you? Pastors, let me speak directly to you and your leaders for a moment. Our communities of faith and our neighborhoods are in chaos and crisis. When the real estate stock market, private debt, and consumer spending markets crashed in America, it facilitated a quote-unquote church market crash as well. No one is talking about it. There was no stimulus, there was no bailout or policy created for the kingdom. In honesty and transparency, the kingdom of God shouldn't operate in reaction to man's economic markets, but should proactively influence them and engage them we must do it ourselves. We must take the lead. We must take action to ensure the sustainability of our ministries, causes, and definitive purpose. Do we have all of the answers? No. Yet, God has given us a prophetic glimpse of what's to come and how to strategically prepare for the future of your churches and our expansion into the marketplace and every relevant sector of modern day society. To this end, I want to invest into you your community, and your church. I will come at no cost to you, to your church. Let's plan an economic dignity weekend together. Let's plan a solutions, a prophetic solutions weekend together. Call my office at 404-995-7094 or online at www.OurEconomicDignity.com. That's 404-995-7094.
or online at www.ourEconomicDignity.com.